Um, we'll just wait a few more minutes to, uh, to make sure a few more people join. Hello everyone. Um, this is the CNCF six storage call. Um, we're just waiting for a couple more users to uh, to join, um, and then uh, Derek and Flavio will be giving uh, us a presentation of of Previga. Um, so we'll we'll just wait for a couple more a uh, couple more minutes. We'll probably start at five past the hour. Okay, um, I think we should we should be able to start. Um, uh, Aaron is going to be joining in a minute. Um, Quentin unfortunately had a power and internet outage, so he might not be able to join. Um, so uh, in that case, um, Derek and Flavio, I'll hand over to you um, to to give um, a bit of an intro of the uh, of the Profiga project. Um, and I assume you have some slides to share. Yeah, so, hi, this is Flavio. C can you all hear me all right? We can. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so let me, let me share my screen. Or I can can everyone see my uh, my slide? Uh, I can. Yep. Okay. All right. So. Um, how much time would you like for this? I, I suppose you don't want me to choose the whole time. Is is that right? So how much time do you do you think I have just so that I calibrate? Um, we we th this is the, the main thing on the agenda for for this meeting. So so you have most of the most of the hour. Okay. All right. Okay. So I won't uh, I won't rush then. Uh, 
my name is Slavio. I am now be talking about Provega as Alex just, um, just introduced. So this is uh, pretty much the same presentation I gave at the CNCF webinar yesterday. Um, I did make a few changes. I removed some of the of the discussion on Flink and I added some um, some uh, some new content. So you know, hopefully, uh, many of you haven't seen that presentation, so it won't be uh, it won't be it will be new to you. Uh, a, before I get into Provega, so a bit about a bit about myself. I am a senior distinguished engineer at Dell. So I've been working on the Provega project since uh, 2016. So I have completed uh, Dell towards the end of 2016. So I completed a bit three years uh, working on the on on the project. So I'll complete four towards the end of the year. My background is is in distributed computing. I was in in research for a number of years. I was uh, researching in Microsoft Research uh, earlier in Yahoo Research, and I work on a, on a number of Apache projects. Uh, most prominent ones that I actually ha I helped to, uh, to 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 build from scratch are Zookeeper and uh, and and Bookkeeper, both in the ASF. So I have some contact information in the case you want to reach out to me uh, or follow me on Twitter. Uh, so email and, uh, and uh, the Twitter handle. So now let me move on and, uh, and, and start talking about motivation in Pravega and such. So the main motivation for Pravega and many of the systems that, uh, that you hear that are dealing with the streams, the stream processing in general, are the many sources of uh, continuously generated data that you ha we have out there. And I, I'm sure that uh, you have come across a, a good number of them, and uh, and uh, and that's not a surprise. But being more concrete about uh, about the sources, they can be events that are end users generating. Uh, we can think of uh, the traditional social networks where uh, users are posting events, uh, or you can think of online shopping where uh, users are purchasing items that are uh, performing online transactions or they are searching for products. So all those generate data that you might want to capture. But it's not only about end users. So you can think of machines uh, also being uh, sources of, um, of continuously generated data. You have servers that are continuously producing telemetry that uh, you want to capture uh, so that you can spot problems early on in, uh, in your fleet of servers. So that would be a uh, when you use case. But it's not only about servers either. There are the types of machines that uh, that many users and applications care about. So sensors in IoT, uh, the whole uh, the promise of uh, connected cars, autonomous cars, and so on. Uh, it's not a, quite a reality yet, but uh, we, we are going towards that direction. So hopefully that, uh, that will become a reality eventually. But all those will be continuously generating data and and ingesting that data and processing it could be uh, could be interesting or or even um, a requirement for a good number of uh, of users. Now, if I put if I put those comments into what I'm calling a landscape here, what we have is on the left hand side we have various sources of uh, of data, end users. We have machines. I don't know. You can have you have drones, sensors. Uh, connected cars, all these things producing a continuous flow of data that I want to capture and that I want to process. But now the processing might not be as simple as just uh, filtering the data or normalizing the data. It can it can have various stages. And so we in the end, you, we need at least two core components so that we are able to achieve this goal of, uh, of ingesting processing the data. One is storage. Right, so so capturing the data, storing it so that I can, I have it available for processing, and second, having a stream processor that is able to take that data and uh, and, and make sense out of it, and those things can be combined in uh, in uh, in a number of ways. You can think of the processing as a, as a directed graph, where you have interleaving stages of of storage and uh, and, and processing. And the, the output of those pipelines can be a number of things. So visualization, where you, um, where you are representing raw data in ways that are just more intuitive or, or are easier to, to, uh, to extract uh, insights out of it. 
you can produce alerts if we talk about a fleet of servers that are, you know, bad things are happening in your, uh, in your infrastructure and you wanna know about it. Uh, general insights uh, about maybe users or your applications, you know, if you have front end applications that uh, you might wanna know that, uh, that uh, you know, there's a spike in traffic or, or, or events of the like. Recommendations, again, if you talk about end users, what other users are looking to, uh, or users with a similar profile. And, and finally, just actionable analytics where you, uh, you you present data or present results that could be useful on any action you want to take, you go visit a customer and you want to know more about the, the accounts or, or anything related to, uh, to that customer you're about to visit. So that's the general landscape. But to talk, in, uh, to talk a bit about um, a few use cases that we have seen in, uh, in the fields. Um, one, a class of applications that, uh, that we find very interesting is the ones related to drones, uh, where you, you're ingesting video produced from the, from the cameras in the drones, uh, along with telemetry. Uh, so both of them are, are sent directly to some infrastructure that uh, they are used to ingest and, uh, and process. And the applications for that, they vary from uh, you know, looking at the health of, of your cattle to inspecting airplanes uh, between flights. And you, you want to do that not only uh, by tailing the stream, by tailing the data, right? So by processing as soon as the data is available for, for processing, but also you might wanna go back and reprocess data. I don't know, maybe you found a bug or you found an issue that uh, you, wanna, you wanna revisit the data and, and extract some new, some new information. And so in, in, in applications like this, not only are you interested in, in, in the low latency aspect of it, tailing the stream and processing as soon as the data is available, but also going back in time at, at some arbitrary point and, uh, and reprocessing. And along similar lines, we have uh, in, in a factory, uh, you can have cameras just recording or I don't know, taking pictures of uh, of parts that are being that are being manufactured and you want to you want to spot for example defects on those parts and so the same concept applies here where you want to spot those problems or those defects as soon as possible so you 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 probably want you probably want to tail the stream and process the data as soon as uh, as you get it but there might be situations again in which you want to go back in time and revisit the data and uh, and reprocess it. So that same concept applies for uh, for such a use cases too. Now focusing on on streams itself, right? So that was um, that's what I wanted to say about about use cases. But now let's let's turn our attention to what streams what these streams actually look like in a in in an abstract way. So natural way of think of think about streams is that they are sequences of uh, of events or records or or messages. I don't know any concept that matters to, to the application. But this this sequence of uh, of data items as they are produced, we keep appending them to the to the sequence. But in reality, in reality, is not just one single flow. If I think that a lot of the a lot of the, the scenarios that I have I've mentioned, I don't know, with servers, with sensors, you have a number of these parallel flows. So it's not one sequence, but you can have you can have many of those in a, in parallel. And so this parallelism gives us um, another degree of, uh, say, realism, right? So it's closer to what we would expect to see in um, in a real application. But it doesn't stop there because we can also have fluctuations in the, in the traffic we're observing. You can have parallelism, uh, so you have the parallelism, but you know, the, the traffic in the parallel flows can, uh, can grow and shrink over time. And that's because you have, uh, you have I don't know, daily cycles, weekly cycles, maybe, you know, periodic cycles, but also you can have spikes on Black Friday or, or Christmas, um, I know some events, that, uh, that get people to access more your system. So all of those could be examples of uh, where you can have changes to the, to the traffic of, uh, of your application and, and consequently of your, uh, of your stream. Now, it's also important 
important to note that uh, if you're talking about continuous gen continuously generated data, you can have this being continuously generated for a very long time. We could be talking about years, right? If, if an application has been running for a long time. And so we we might want to capture we might want to capture the stream from the beginning and keep it as a stream. Uh, in in the recent past, a lot of uh, of applications they have they, they they tend to split the stream data into say fresh recently ingested data, which is the part that you you essentially keep tailing right. So it's the recent data that you are you are um, you're capturing and processing, and the older historical data that maybe you have already processed and uh, you might want to reprocess in the future. And so for that matter, you maybe use a different system even to, uh, to store it. And I'm, I'm going to call it the Lambda way, just in reference to, uh, to what people call the Lambda architecture. But the reality is that uh, it, would be, it would be ideal for applications that they didn't have to make such a distinction, that they could ingest a stream, uh, of course, they can get rid of data in the stream truncate and so on. But if uh, if they need to keep the data, then they should ingest the stream and keep it as a stream for as long as the data is needed. So, no, no such a distinction between fresh and uh, and historical data. Now, these streams are not, not only about writing. I have focused a lot on the on the write part, right? So one sequence parallelism, then uh, then traffic fluctuations and the ingestion. But th there is a big part of it is also on the on the read side. So making sure that uh, that an application that wants to process it is actually able to cope with uh, to deal with the the, the flow of data, um, no matter in what form, if it fluctuates, if it's parallel or what. So read scalability is another important aspect. So with, with all those concepts in in mind. Um, what the, the main goal of Pravega or the, the, the vision we had for Pravega when we started is that we wanted to have a storage system that has stream as a primitive. So it, it has streams going in and has streams going out. So traditionally, uh, storage systems have focused on, uh, on objects and files. And we we thought that uh, that uh, given the nature of a lot of applications that we're seeing, um, they it's more natural that that they use uh, streams as uh, as their core primitive. And now using the concepts I have just explained, uh, those streams they have to be implemented in such a way that I that the system is able to accommodate an unbounded amount of data. That the stream is elastic, uh, that is consistent. We don't want to we don't want to duplicate events or miss events, and that applications are able to both tail and and process data historically. And I'm referring to, to this as a cloud native way of a, of a, a um, of a exposing streams, because those are all concepts that uh, that we find very important when building cloud systems. So let me now move to talk about Pravega specifically. Now, Pravega builds on the concept of, uh, of segments. A segment is a single sequence of, uh, of bytes, and it's our storage unit, right? So it's the, it's the unit that, uh, that we store in our uh, lowest uh, storage system. It's an append-only sequence of bytes. Um, it's bytes, not events. I have, been, uh, I have mentioned events before, and that appears at the API level, but but internally, we treat as a sequence of uh, of bytes. Now, to convert from bytes to uh, to uh, sorry to events from by to bytes, we use uh, serialization. So we expect the application to provide uh, a way of serializing the 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 data and the serializing on the on the way out. So segments enable us to have parallelism. I can have a number of segments in uh, in parallel that hey, um, um that diff flavio um could i just ask a very quick question here um yeah of course so does does Profiga just focus on on the storage of the streams um or does it have um or does it have any functionality to kind of do some of that serialization so you know uh, as an example, 
is it is is it only just doing the raw streams or does it have some higher level functionality like like similar to what say a message queue might might do for example so you do have the ability of writing events um you just the provega the provega client expects you to pass a serializer and a deserializer so the serializer on the way in the deserializer it will use the deserializer on the way out so the application writes an event, but internally we store it as bytes. So Provega internally does not understand the events, it only understands the bytes. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thanks. So so the segments that we store internally, they enable us to have parallelism. So you can have the, the various clients writing to those segments in um, in parallel. And we use routing keys to map the appends. Of, uh, of, of data to those segments. Now, these segments um, also enable us to vary that degree of parallelism, which I'm gonna call scaling. So I can start, if I start from the, the head of the stream, which, which in this representation, it starts from the, from the right. If I start with two segments, then I, at some point my traffic goes up, I decide that I, I need a larger number of segments and I, I transition from two to, to five. Uh, at some later points, uh, traffic goes down and uh, I, I drop from five to three. Right? So that's viable with, uh, with a Provega stream. And as I mentioned, we have this, um, we, have this um, uh, we have this notion of scaling and this scaling can be done in an automatic manner. So when you configure a stream, you can say that you want auto scaling enable and so Provega will track the traffic and, uh, and we'll do that scaling automatically for you. Segments also allow us to implement um, to implement transactions efficiently and effectively. We when you when you start a transaction from a, from from an application, Provega creates segments for temporary segments for those uh, for those um, for the application for that transaction, and any append in the context of the transaction will go to those segments. Now, if the transaction commits, then those segments are merged to the main segments of, a, of the stream. And in the case of an abort, we just discard those, uh, those segments. So that data, the data of a transaction does not interfere with the data in the primary segments of, a, of the stream until the, the, the transaction is, uh, is committed. And if it's aborted, we simply discard the, those segments and the data in them. So that's another benefit of, a, of, a, of having cheap segments in the way we have in, a, in Provega. Yet another thing that we can do with segments, we can have a, a, um, conditional appends. Conditional appends, uh, which we do in, in revision streams, uh, we, it, they work by comparing the, the offset. So if, you, if you're trying to append and and you want to make sure that uh, that the pen happens um, in in uh, in a state that reflects your, your your observation of the state, then it will be accepted and it will be appended. If the offset has moved, which means that probably you don't have the latest state, then uh, that uh, that append is rejected. And this is um, this is a, a way of implementing uh, consistent consistent states. At the application level, we do that via a primitive that we call the state synchronizer, which we both expose in the API and uh, and we use it internally. And one of the things that you can do with this is build replicated state machines, right? And note that uh, this is that we are doing this via using optimistic uh, concurrency. And so we have again these two um, these two primitives that we expose. One is revision streams. And another one that is a state synchronizer. The state synchronizer builds on uh, on revision streams. Let me talk a, a bit about one of the one of the key features that we have. I mentioned stream scaling, but I want to talk a bit more about that. I, go, I want to go in, in more depth about it. I mentioned that uh, when you're scaling a stream, we go from from we can go from one segment to many, or we can uh, we we can merge segments and and go from uh, from more segments to uh, uh, to fewer. Scaling can 
be done both automatically and manually. So auto scaling will react to changes to the traffic. So you configure stream to, to perform auto scaling. And, uh, and um, if Provega observes changes, important changes to traffic, then you will scale up or down. But you can also do it manually. So you can also uh, uh, proactively scale the stream. So for example, if you expect some traffic and you want to increase the degree of parallelism of, of your stream, you can go and manually do it before the, the events or before you have that spike. Now illustrating how, how that looks um, in a, if, for a particular stream. So say that, uh, that we, we start with a single segment, stream with a single segment. And what this graph is showing is the routing key space versus time. Remember that the routing keys, the routing keys are um, the elements we use to map events that are being appended to, uh, to segments. And so in this case, if I'm starting with a single segment, all the keys in the routing key space are mapped to the same, to the same segment. Now say that uh, I have two hotkeys. And, and those two hotkeys induce enough load that Provega decides that uh, it needs to split that one segment into two. Say, for, for the sake of example, say that those rout the, the routing keys are representing geographic locations. Uh, for example, I have uh, some taxi ride application uh, or some taxi ride data. I'm looking at the, the, the geolocation of the, the taxi rides, where they're starting, where they're ending. And so those two locations turn out to be hot for some reason. There is an event or people just congregating there. I guess these days that's, uh, that's probably not happening. But, uh, but you know, before all this, before the virus situation that I, I suppose that was a common, uh, uh, a common thing. So Provega splits into two new segments, two and three. Now let's say that that was not enough and, and it still induces enough load that uh, you want, it needs, it requires a higher degree of parallelism. So now I split segment two in, into four and five. And at a later time, say that those keys go back to code. Now Provega goes and, uh, and, and merges four and five back into, into six. So that's the, that would be the final state of, uh, of the stream, at least for the, the time frame that we are looking to. Now, one interesting thing to observe from this is that a single routing key does not always map to the same segment. It varies, it can vary over time if you have auto scaling enabled. So if I pick, for example, up 0 0.9, then it started with segment one, then, then was mapped to segment two, then four, then six. So at different points in time, uh, a particular routing key mapped to, a, to different segments. And even though this may sound a complication for the application, uh, the application doesn't need to, to really, uh, it does not really observe this. I mean, these changes to segments are, are, are completely hidden from, uh, from the application and uh, we deal with it uh, under the hood. Now, let me sh show you a graph uh, that illustrates the changes to, to segments uh, over time, but now from a, a real run. So we have this heat map that shows segments and the loads on, uh, on, on the segments. So the, the color represents load. So light blue means that it's lightly loaded and, and bright red means that it's, uh, it's heavily loaded. The white lines represent the separation between segments. And what we observe here is if we start from the left, uh, we observe that uh, we have a number of segments and, and slowly those segments are merging. And so we, we see fewer and fewer segments down to a minimum that uh, starts around uh, 2.30 a.m. and goes all the way to around uh, 5.30 a.m. And we have only two segments during that period. And from around 5.30 a.m., 6 a.m., we start seeing segments splitting again and it's bleeding more and more, and, and we see a, a good amount of, of red in the segments, which means that, uh, that there is a good amount of workload in, uh, in, in those segments. And this is precisely observed, observing the traffic that we used to generate that, uh, that, that, that figure. So we took, the, um, we took data from this New York City yellow 
taxi trip records. Uh, we, we took half a day from it and we just ran it through Prevega to observe that uh, those changes to the to, to, to the segments. And we, we see precisely that. So it starts with some amount of traffic and it slowly uh, drops down to a minimum. And then at some point early in the morning, it starts picking up again. And if we put them both together now, we we can observe uh, we can observe that uh, that effect where the change to traffic causes the segments to uh, to merge initially, uh, and then split again when the traffic picks up. Let me now move to talk about the the Prevega architecture. So as I, as I mentioned before, we have event writers. Um, that's one of, uh, of our APIs. We have other APIs like a Bystream API, um, but the event API is an important one. Many applications, they have the, the abstraction of events or, or similar abstractions that can be mapped to, to events. And so using the event API, uh, writers append to a, a Pravega stream, to the segments of a Pravega stream, and we track the position of the writer so that in the case of a, of a disconnection and followed by reconnection that uh, the writer is able to resume from the, the right position. Then to consume the data, we have the, the notion of, a, of reader groups. So we group event readers into groups that we use to split the load of segments, um, to balance that load as well. And that gives me the ability of growing in, in shrinking the set so that uh, if I need more capacity for reads, uh, then I, I can do it. If I don't need as much and I want to reclaim some resources, I can, uh, I can remove some readers as well. And, and reader groups operate uh, even in the presence of, uh, of scaling. And so that balancing of uh, an assignment of, uh, of segments happens even uh, when in the presence of, uh, of scaling. And the readers are not aware of, uh, of those changes. That happens and it's coordinated internally using a, a state synchronizer. Now, the two main components of, uh, of Pravega itself are the controller and the segment store. The controller manages the, the life cycle of streams. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it commands the segment store, for example, to create segments when, uh, when, when it needs to. It also manages transactions that we run against, uh, against, against streams. The segment store is responsible for managing the lifecycle of segments and for storing them. So that's, uh, that's our underlying storage layer. So the segment store doesn't know anything about streams. A stream is a concept of, uh, of the controller. And, and the controller is the one responsible for exposing that, uh, that concept to the to applications. The segment store only deals with, uh, with segments. We use tiered storage. Uh, the first tier of storage is we expect it to be a, a low latency option for small writes. So we have chosen to use Apache Bookkeeper. And for the second tier, which we call the long-term storage tier, uh, we, we we have different options, and we can we can build up we can uh, configure it to use either file or object. Uh, in principle, the, the system is agnostic to uh, what is being done there, as long as we impl we have bindings to connect to uh, to such systems. So, for example, we can use HDFS there, or we can use an NFS mount. We also use Apache Bookkeeper for for coordinating. Uh, the assignment of, uh, of um, what we call segment containers. So that's not to be confused with Linux containers. Th those are, that's the abstraction we use to represent groups of, um, of segments. And that's the units we use to assign work to the different segment store instances. Let me, let me talk a bit more about this. Um, so the controller is the one responsible for assigning um, segment containers to the different segment store instances. So each segment, each segment container, is responsible for a, for a, a group of um, of segments, and and to determine where a particular segment is going to land, with respect to segment containers, we use we use we hash the name of uh, of the segment. 
Now, in this particular example, I'm showing that the controller assigning three segment containers to each one of the of the um, of the segment store instances. In the case that, say, I add another segment store instance, uh, what the control will do is we'll remap the segment containers. Uh, we shut down segment containers in a, in existing or some of them in existing uh, segment store instances and map them to the to the to the new one. So in that way, we distribute the loads. Uh, you taking into account new uh, new new segment store instances. You can also remove them. I'm illustrating adding one, but of course you can remove, and that's also um, redistributed. Now talk a bit more about the write and the read path. So on the write path, if uh, uh, the first thing that I, an event stream writer needs to do if he wants to append data is to determine which segment store hosts the, the um, it's the segment he wants to append to, you know, based on the segment uh, on the segment container. And so he finds that information from the controller, and at that point he connects to the segment store and starts um, appending the bytes. Now the segment store will write to Bookkeeper, and only when he receives a response from Bookkeeper that uh, is persistent, he will respond back to the to, to the event stream, stream writer. So Bookkeeper, on its turn, uh, uh, persists the data in in a journal, and so it's guaranteed that uh, that is on on disk by the time that uh, the event stream writer receives the the acknowledgement. And the data to to long term storage to tier two. That is propagated asynchronously. And as I mentioned before, we, we have a, a few options available, HDFS and NFS, uh, all those um, built on, a, on a, a file or object. For the read path, we have a similar structure. The stream readers get information about segments from the controller. They read bytes from the, uh, from the, segment, from the corresponding segment store. The segment store responds with data in the cache. If it's a cache hit because it's tailing a stream, then uh, they will return uh, immediately. If not, they need to read the data from, from tier two. And the data in Bookkeeper is not used for reads. At this point, it's only used for, uh, for, recovering, for recovery purposes. So if a segment store instance crashes and it needs to recover the data uh, for, for a particular um, segment container or set of segment containers, then you will use the data in a, in Apache Bookkeeper ledgers. All right, so that's that's what I wanted to cover about the the Pravega you know, segments, uh, concepts, features, and uh, and a bit of its architecture. Let me now say a few words about stream processors, which is essentially connecting Pravega to applications. We hey, so can far, I, um, Flavio, could, could I just ask a, a very quick question about the Apache Bookkeeper? Yeah, go. Um, so, 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 in effect, is that is, is the Apache Bookkeeper kind of your transaction log, your right ahead look kind of thing? Exactly. You can you can look at it this way. Right. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the, to connect Provega to applications, um, we typically use connectors, uh, especially if you're talking about, uh, well, so if, let me start back. So if you're talking about an application you're building from scratch, then of course you can just go in and use the clients directly. But you have, um, say, frameworks, which you want to, to generic frameworks that you want to connect to Provega. And for those, you want to build um, sync and, and source connectors. So the sync connector will allow you to output data to a Provega stream. The source connector will allow you to, um, to read data from a, from a Provega stream. So one example is the, the Flink connectors that we have developed. So the, uh, the reference to the repositories at the bottom of, of the slide. But that's a general concept for uh, for connectors that uh, that we can use for systems like Flink or other stream processors. So existing connectors that uh, that we that we have implemented or are aware of. So we have one for Apache Flink, which I have just mentioned. Then we have one for Hadoop. We have Logstash plugins. There is one contributed by the community for Alpaca, and uh, and there are a good number of other ones that uh, we are implementing, and uh, and we expect the community to contribute as well. 
so I I I have skipped a, a good um, a good amount of slides that I had on Flink. If anyone is interested in talking more about this, I I have backup slides about that, but I I will skip it for now and move on and talk about um Prevega and Kubernetes. So we have implemented operators. So operators uh, are in a custom controller for managing the lifecycle of, uh, of an application. That would be a, a, ge a general definition. And we have used that uh, in, a, in a few places. And uh, our operators, they, uh, they do a number of things. They, they worry about the deployment, uh, about configuration. So we talk about uh, pod disruption budgets, uh, uh, pod affinity and anti-affinity rules, uh, you know, validating, making sure that we, we are um, um, satisfying those. Uh, assigning default values to two variables, so all those things. It takes care of scaling. In the case of the Prevega operator, it's responsible for uh, for upgrades. So if upgrading from uh, from one version to to another one, that's the that would be the responsibility of the operator to uh, to take care of it and also monitoring the health of uh, of the individual components. We have implemented three different operators for the different components that. Uh, well, for the various parts of the system. So we have for the Provega operator that covers the controller and the segment store. Then we have the bookkeeper operator and zookeeper operator. So all those three are, are open source at, at the moment. And what I wanted to do is show, um, show quickly a cluster that, uh, that we have deployed. It's running a longevity workloads. It, this particular longevity workload is is running uh, it, so it characterized by a small set of routing keys so it, it focus it targets traffic using um, a small set of routing keys which is a known uniform load distribution across those keys right so we're not using all keys just a, a small set so uh, gives me a skewed distribution of uh, of the workload so let me um, let me show it running. Give me a minute. Can I just say it's particularly good form to uh, to have a uh, a live demo during a project presentation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so I have um, we have I have set up this before the call because uh, there are a number of steps I need to get this running. So I I'm, I want to show this running already. So I won't be running a lot of a. Uh, a lot of commands is also in the interest of time, but um, let's let's see. Why am I not? Okay, so these are the pods that are that are running in this cluster. So as as you can see. Let's see if I can annotate this. Uh, as you can see, we have Grafana and Influx to be running. Then we have uh, a set of, uh, of three bookies. We have the Provega operator running. Then we have a single controller and a single segment store. And we have five zookeepers running here, zookeeper servers and the zookeeper operator. So this version of um, of the of the operator was not using, the, so was incorporating the the um, actions of uh, of bookkeeper as well, and so we I don't have a the, the bookkeeper operator running separately here, but there are operators I have described this uh, is in a separate repository and it's available as well. Um, now let me show. Okay. So this is Grafana. This is the Grafana dashboard for um, for that cluster. So let me start with this uh, the operation dashboard and show. So this is the the traffic we're imposing. We are putting between six and eight. Hold on a second. I'm not seeing it. Uh, displaying quite yet. Okay, there you go. Yeah. 
Right, so as you can see in this graph here, segment write bytes per second, uh, we're putting a load that's between six and, and eight megabytes uh, consistently. So as I mentioned, this is a longevity test that we run continuously. And, and one of the interesting things that we can see here is the number of the, the uh, variation of the number of segments. Remember that, um, that the distribution of, of load across keys is, uh, is skewed. So I, I am sending to a small set of keys. I, if I remember correctly, it's four. And so it's expected that, uh, that we get a good number of splits. So increases in the number of segments. And then at some point this starts dropping again until it converges. So that's the expected behavior. All right, so uh, that's that's what I wanted to show quickly, just to see that uh, that uh, that uh, the cluster running and some of these graphs. Let me go back to the to the presentation. If you have any questions about this, I can come back to it and uh, and show some more. Uh, and all right, so that was a, a quick review of a Prevega cluster live. Now to wrap up, to wrap up, the main motivation for us to pursue a system to, to store streams was the observation that uh, we have a, a very good number of, uh, of, uh, of applications out there that have sources of, uh, that are continuously producing data. And we felt that a lot of those applications would map their uh, their the abstraction that uh, that they have of the sources to streams rather than file or objects, which are the traditional primitives you find in storage systems. Now we have put the effort into making this the streams unbounded, elastic, and consistent from a storage perspective. And we have also done the work of uh, of connecting them to a stream process so that we can extract the value out of the data. It's not only about ingesting and storing, but also being able to, um, to derive value out of the data. I gave one example, which is Apache Flink. I mentioned some others, but Apache Flink is the main one that we have been working with. Um, the project is open source, is under Apache License V2 at the moment. It's hosted on GitHub. And uh, we are looking for a home for, uh, for incubation. So we are looking at, uh, at our options for, uh, for incubation at this time. And before I close, just a, a few comments on uh, anyone who could be interested in starting with Provega. So I want to give a few pointers. Um, check the website. There's a good amount of documentation there. You have even videos and, uh, and, uh, and blog posts in addition to, to project documentation. Um, check the, the organization on GitHub and, uh, and the repository, the main repository. There are a number of repositories there. Pravega is the, is the main one with respect to what I presented today, but you also have the connectors I have mentioned. Then you can run Pravega standalone, right? Locally, if you want to do some quick testing or even some development, um, you can run that along with, uh, with Pravega samples. So we have a number of samples in that, uh, in that uh, Pravega samples repository. And to try on Kubernetes, I suggest that uh, you know go look at, uh, at the repository, the instructions there. And throughout that process, you know, feel free to give feedback and even contribute if uh, if you see anything that uh, you'd be interested in changing or or improving or or you know anything. And that's uh, with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, so this last slide gives a good number of uh, of references for uh, for all the things I have mentioned during the presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. That was that was very informative. It's it's interesting and it's I guess um, slightly different to um, some of the sort of typical storage projects that we've discussed so far. So this is um, this is a very interesting alternative. Um, you mentioned you were looking for. Um, place to uh, to donate the, the project to um, are you familiar with the, um, the the sort of projects um, graduation structure in the CNCF um, a, a little bit I'm not very familiar I'm, I'm, I'm more familiar with the ASF way of uh, 
uh, of doing things. I'm not as familiar with uh, CNCF or even the Linux Foundation in general. I mean, we have spoken uh, with people in, uh, in across CNCF, sorry, um, across the Linux Foundation, including CNCF. But I don't know. It's uh, anything you want to mention would definitely be a uh, be of use. So if you wanna, if you wanna give any information about that, that will be useful. I'm sure. All right. So 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 perhaps. Um... I can send you I an email um, after this. I have yep. dropped a link Perfect. The into chat. <laughs> Perfect. That's really helpful. Um, but uh, so so just just to quickly summarize, there there are um, there are sort of three levels of um, of projects. Um, the the starting level um, is a is a sandbox project, um, and this has relatively low uh, a relatively low bar to entry so so it's kind of um, good if you're if you're trying to help build the community and um, you know address maybe um, IP policy related changes or or um, help uh, grow the number of maintainers for example of, of the project um, the next level up is the incubator level um, and that covers that has that has a that has um, a higher bar, and um, there are a number of um, different uh, criteria. Um, and then finally, there's there are the graduated projects, but graduation then requires um, additional things like uh, for a security audit, for example. So um, it would be it would be useful to to understand your thinking on this and and at what level you 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 are considering because obviously there are um there's there's a different workflow and a different process and and and, and uh different levels of due diligence that that we would need to consider um sure so in in your view what would be the difference again between sandbox and uh, any incubation I mean, what what would make anyone go for sandbox rather than incubation directly? That's um, that would be my question. Um, it's it's typically down to project maturity. Um, so so the incubation level um, requires um, a number of criteria, like for example, having maintainers from different organizations or or, or and end users and having the project being used in production those those sorts of things um so so mm -hmm. you know if if you can't get some of those references or or you know maybe um maybe the the project is very focused on just one organization um that might be an opportunity to to go in at sandbox level to kind of grow the community further got it okay that that makes perfect sense. All right. I okay. That's interesting. Interesting and thank yeah. Sorry. Um, I my I don't know my audio is breaking up. I don't know if it's me or everyone else as well. But I, thanks for presenting. I think it's definitely as Alex said a, a very different project than we're used to looking at. Um, so. Uh, I think it'd be a good asset to add to our portfolio in CNCF. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Amy. It's Amy, oh. right? No, that was uh, uh, Aaron. Aaron, okay. Sorry, I, I, I guess I saw the wrong. Okay, yeah. Aaron, thank you. Hello, uh, this is Luis. I just want to thank you for, for this. Uh, this is really nice. Uh, I'm very different. I think we need to expand our our landscape document that we have for document for storage systems. Um, so uh, one of the questions is, is that you, know, you have a lot of Apache projects. What, uh, you know, I'm just curious, you know, why go after a CNCF uh, approval instead of going part of the ASF? Excellent question. Um, I would say that uh, I, I personally haven't entirely made up my mind. I have, I have been with, uh, I, I, Except for a for a board uh, director, I have been in everything in the ASF. I am committed to projects. I am part of uh, PMCs. I am an Apache member. I have been part of incubators. So I know the ASF pretty well. Um, I have heard great things 
about the Linux Foundation and and CNCF in particular. I have been very impressed with the the infrastructure and and the group of people and the projects. And so I I decided to explore. I thought it would be a good idea to explore. And so it's it's a it's definitely a, a strong contender in a, in my list. It's a, it, it's it's looking pretty solid. All the work that uh, that people have been doing, um, all the projects, and again the infrastructure. I think that all counts and uh, and helps projects to be uh, to be successful. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. So so thanks again for for presenting. Um, Amy or Aaron, unless there are any other things that we need to raise, I think um, this covers our our agenda today. Yes, I th I think we should pass on uh, the maybe sandbox at least to start templates, so it, it helps answer some of these questions like Luis was answering, to structure it in a way that would help you understand which level of uh, acceptance you think the project would go into. Um, so I'll go ahead and forward that on to you, Flavio, and then uh, I think we'll go from there once once it's structured in a way. Oh, thank you, Amy. Once it's structured in a way that uh, we could move forward and understand what you guys are looking to get out of it. Uh, this that is sounds a great. Thank you. This is a question to uh, most of us, not not really Flavio, but I thought projects always started as sandbox first. Nope. That's not accurate. There okay. are projects that can generally, I mean, they don't come in as graduation. I think that's kind of a given, okay. but they can start as incubation provided, you know, they're have a lot of support within the community. Um, sandbox okay. meant to be that springboard. Um, and, and so without really understanding it in, in terms of all the other different aspects, I don't think I could re make a recommendation one way or the other. Okay, I think cool. Vita started as an incubation project. Yeah, Arco just came in as an incubation. Okay, yeah, Vita was like the early days of this project, the CNCF stuff. And I was wondering if we had changed the format, but if, I understand now. It was cool. Okay. Thank you. Not that I know of Luis, but it's fluid. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's good. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So I think I think we're done, and we're coming up to time too. So thanks everybody, um, and we'll see. And we'll speak to each other in the next couple of weeks. And I hope everybody's keeping well and staying healthy. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you for the opportunity of presenting to this group. Uh, thank. Thanks again, Flavio. Be well. Everyone. Bye now. See you online. All right. Bye.